Better? Good. All right, cool. All right. Um, push the I push the button. I'm blinking blue. We're good to go. Uh, so I'm Adam Driscoll. Um, you can talk to me on Twitter if you have ever questions after this or you know whatever. Email me. I'm a senior application developer at Concurrency. We're a small little uh, consulting shop out of the Milwaukee area. I do a lot of like Azure and System Center stuff. Um, I was also the developer for uh, the PowerShell tools for Visual Studio. Um, so that's kind of my open source baby. Um, and today we're going to be talking about PowerShell module development lifecycle. So what does that actually mean? So what we're going to do um, during this talk is cover these kind of main points. First of all, I'm just going to kind of talk about what a development lifecycle is and why you want to use something like this for your PowerShell modules. Um, then we're going to look at some tooling that you can use for your uh, development lifecycle. So we're going to start with uh, GitHub issues and milestones. So I'm going to kind of go over the basics of what that means, how to track requirements, how to do some sort of design um, using uh, GitHub. Then we're going to talk about GitHub for source control. So there's a lot of different source control systems out there. Um, I just picked GitHub for the purpose of this demo because it's free and available on the internet. Um, so we're going to look at the basics of that, how to get your code up in there. I'm not going to get into super you know, detailed uh, description of all the things you can do with GitHub source control because Git's pretty uh, complex. That could be a talk in itself. Um, from there, we're actually going to talk about AppBear. AppBear is a continuous integration system that you can actually hook up to your Git, uh, GitHub repository and it integrates really, really nicely. And we're going to use that for uh, running automated pester tests. And actually, I should add here for deploying to the PowerShell gallery. So uh, we're going to use AppBear to deploy to the gallery. So then our module is then available for download from the gallery. So you can kind of think of this as the entire life cycle of your module. So why do we need an application uh, the development life cycle or module development life cycle? This is kind of like a classic. Uh, you know, software development cartoon that you always see around the place, and it's like a kind of a you know a hate on communication. Um, the customer describes their swing as this like weird three-tiered swing that um, doesn't really make too much sense, but kind of gets the point across. And my favorite one is how the programmer wrote it because it's this crappy little string, you know, swing uh, hanging on the ground, um, pretty much like all the code I write. And then uh, the business consultant obviously is this grand chair hanging in the tree. Um, I love how it's documented, it's just missing. Um, the customer was built like it was a roller coaster, but in the end, what they really needed was a tire swing. So because of that, we kind of have this iterative development process, and it's been kind of a, um, a term that's been around for a while in the application world, and it applies directly to module development. Because if you think about it, a module really just is a different type of application. Um, and it's circular in nature. So you know, you, you hear things like uh, agile development processes and uh, iterative development and everything. Um, this is the, the case for iterative development of an application. So you kind of start with requirements gathering. And this is where you go and talk to your key stakeholders. And depending on what kind of module you're making, um, it might be you know, yourself. You might be the key stakeholder for that module. But it might be people in your company or people out on the internet might find interest in this. So you want to go out and kind of pull those people, gather requirements, and then get those requirements kind of documented, prioritized, um, and figure out what you need to get done first, that kind of thing. From there, you're going to kind of move on to a design step. A lot of people may think that you, know, you don't actually do too much design. You know, I don't do too many Visios or anything like that. But you know, there's a lot of design conversations that at least take place. You might be whiteboarding something or um, you know, just having a conversation on GitHub issues where you're dropping pictures, you're saying, you know, like, why did you do it this way, that kind of thing. So uh, there's at least a conversation around design. From there, we get to the fun part, which is development. So everybody loves writing code, you know, churning out your favorite editor. Um, but there's a lot of uh, nuances that come with that. You want to be able to track your changes. You want to integrate with other people developing on your module. Um, you want to be able to, you know, roll back in case something happens, that kind of thing. And kind of integrated with uh, development is testing. So there's the whole concept that uh, you, know, you should be testing while you're developing. So test-driven development or behavior-driven development. But there's kind of testing that takes uh, place after the development has uh, completed, like user acceptance testing. So there's tooling out there to help us um, you know, manage that. From there, we have to think about release. So it's great now that we have all this code up in GitHub, but uh, historically, it's been kind of hard to get access to PowerShell modules. Um, you had to download a zip, you had to make sure the files were unblocked before it would load it and that kind of thing. But nowadays, we have the PowerShell gallery. So we can manage the releases a little bit easier. You know, we can get it out to the general populace a lot, lot quicker. Um, 
But we have to think about things like breaking changes. We have to think about version numbers and that kind of thing. So that's where the, the release uh, management comes into play. And as you can see, then we move back into requirements gathering. Because you know after you release it, the first thing that someone's going to respond to you is like, this doesn't work, or why did you do it this way, or I need this feature. So you just continue to work through this application lifecycle. So when you see terms like ALM, that's application lifecycle management. And that's kind of what we're thinking about in terms of module design. So there's a bunch of tooling available out there for this kind of stuff. So you can use a lot of the same tools that um, you know, other software developers are using. So you know, C Sharp and uh, .NET developers are using GitHub. We can use GitHub for PowerShell modules. Like I said, it's, just, it's still just software development. So you can use tools for requirements, design and gathering, like you know, GitHub issues, Jira for uh, tracking work items, or even like uh, Visual Studio Team Services. So a lot of these things are free for open source developers or um, small projects and stuff like that. Um, and then when you move into like the development phase, you can use things like your favorite editor. You can check things into GitHub or Bitbucket or GitLab or whatever you want to use for that. Testing, in the PowerShell world, we have Pester, which is great for both kind of unit and integration testing. And it's really straightforward. And it actually integrates really well with AppBear, which I'll show you later. Um, finally, when we get to release management, uh, you're going to be, you can use things like GitHub where you can put your releases up there. They have a release concept, um, but pretty much for PowerShell modules, you're going to want to start using the PowerShell gallery so people can easily install your module. And then kind of managing the orchestration of all this is our build system. So what we're going to look at today is using AppBear. So AppBear, free for open source projects. You can also get a paid tier. It gives you a few more bells and whistles. Um, and then there's things like Jenkins. If you uh, go up to PowerShell.org, they actually have free continuous integration uh, systems running on Jenkins, I think, for, um, for open source PowerShell projects. I think it's Team City. Is it Team City? OK. All right. But yeah, that would be another build system that could be in, you know, in this list. All right, so I'm going to do the, uh, the most dangerous demo of all time right now. And I'm going to rely on conference internet to communicate with three different web services. <laughs> so <laughs> nothing is scripted here. All right, uh, and what's funny is I was actually working on this, uh, this presentation yesterday, and GitHub had an outage for about 20 minutes in the middle of my practice. I'm like, oh no, what did I do? But uh, it looks like it's actually back up and running today, so hopefully uh, it works. But um, so sign up for a GitHub account, super easy, you know, just like anything else. When you sign in, yours is going to look a little different. Like I follow a bunch of stuff, so that's why I'm seeing all these notifications and I have all these repos on the right hand side. What you're going to want to look at is a new repository button. So you click that, and you can create a new repository. Let's say I want to create my module, and my module is going to be a lorem ipsum generator. So it's just kind of a random uh, text generator. So just name your repository, and then you know you can put a description in there. It's telling me that this repository is available. Um, public repositories are free, so you can just sign up and you know uh, get that for free. Private repositories are not, um, but they're relatively cheap. But um, for the purpose of this demo, we want to make a public repository for people to communicate uh, on, on this particular uh, module. So the first thing you want to do is uh, initialize with a readme. A readme is just that page that you see when you first load up a GitHub page where it'll have like, you know, a description, it might have some images, you know, a how-to, that kind of thing. Like, what is this thing? So you can initialize it with a readme and then you always want to select a license. So I've actually had uh, modules that I've published that didn't have a license specified. And um, I've had people comment and say, like, I can't even use your code because you don't have a license and my company won't allow it. So you have to be careful um, which license you select. And you want to make sure that you have one because it kind of covers your butt as well as whoever's using your code. And if you're ever curious about what a license means, uh, you can head over to uh, tldrlegal.com and you can just search the different licenses. And it has like a super easy to understand breakdown of what that license actually means and you know what what's covered there so there's all kinds of cool stuff like what's a you know GPL license and why shouldn't I use it that kind of thing all right so now we're ready to create a repository and luckily that was pretty quick um, so now we have a repository where I can check in code I can create issues um, I can set up my wiki all that kind of stuff but if we're gonna follow the kind of development life cycle the first thing we want to do is start tracking what uh, requirements we have for our particular module. Well, a lorem ipsum module really needs to be able to, uh, <laughs> I've already typed in here, uh, really needs to be able to generate text. So generate random text. So 
The, uh, the markdown language that you can put in these uh, GitHub issues is really rich. So you can do all kinds of things like uh, put quoted text, you can have code, you can do links, you can have images, you can actually reference um, commits and other users so they get notifications, all that kind of stuff. But um, we're gonna just uh, leave that blank for now and look at some of the other options on the right hand side here. So labels allow you to kind of uh, categorize your different issues. You can have multiple labels on an item. Um, in this case, it's an enhancement since we don't have any code here yet. Um, you can create your own labels and all that kind of stuff. There is also the concept of milestone. So a milestone is kind of like a, you know, a container for a bunch of different uh, issues. So, for example, uh, we'll create this issue and we'll go back to the issues tab and you can actually create a milestone here. So you can actually group issues and pull requests into a particular uh, Milestone and milestones can be time boxed. So you can say, I want this this milestone done by you know the seventh. And then it's great for things like releases, like you know, 2.0 should be released on the 23rd. Or it's good for features where you might want to say all these issues relate to this particular feature. But we're gonna say I want all this completed by the end of this session. Alright, so now I have my uh, issue set up and you can see it, it maintains like a history of things that are either referencing it or have been added to it. So now if I set like the milestone you can say oh it's been added to this milestone. I can add a comment like this is a great idea. All my ideas are great ideas. And then my favorite new feature is that you can upvote things. So that's pretty awesome. Which is actually kind of helpful when you go and look at an issue and you see how many people have actually said like yeah we should probably implement this. even though uh, the issue pane is kind of uh, organized by when it was submitted, sort of thing. So, I mean, you can reorganize it if you need to, but um, yeah. So, now that we have an issue, let's actually go out and uh, try to get some code up here. So, you're going to go back to the code tab, and um, there's a couple buttons here that are helpful. So, right here, this is the actual URL that you can use for any Git client. So, there's you know, a million Git clients out there. Um, my favorite one is called Git Kraken because it's a really cool name. <laughs> and then uh, there's this handy button here though that uh, you can click that actually will trigger one of these uh, you know, built-in tools directly from the website. Um, GitHub Desktop is kind of GitHub's official you know, client. Um, and then you can use Visual Studio. Uh, I actually have GitHub Desktop on here already so I'll just click that. It'll ask me to launch this application. I'll click that and GitHub Desktop will pop up and ask me where I want to clone this repository. So I'll click OK. So now it's actually cloning the repository out to my local box. When it does that, I get the entire repository local. So if you haven't used Git before, Git is like a distributed source control system. So when you clone a repository, you're actually getting an entire copy of that entire source control system. And it has some links back to where it came from and that's how you sync back up to your, uh, you know, your upstream repository. So now I have my license and readme file available. You can actually go look um, in my GitHub folder. I have those files locally here. So I could go ahead and edit that stuff, but let's actually implement our module. But luckily enough, I already have done that. So um, I have a module sitting here that all it does is generate some lorem ipsum text. It has one function in it. Um, it accepts min, max words, min, max sentences, has some lorem ipsum text, and then outputs that to uh, the command line when it's done, or the output stream when it's done. And as any good developer, I also have some pester tests I wrote. So the pester tests test to make sure that certain things are happening uh, when I'm you know, generating this lorem ipsum text. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to copy these to that folder. Um, and if we go look in that folder now, you'll see that I have these two files. And um, if we go back to the GitHub client, You'll see here that now I have these two files as changes in the changes tab here. So anything that's marked in green on this right hand side is an addition. Anything that would be marked in red is a subtraction. So you can see the changes in the code. Since I'm just adding two files, the entire thing is green. So first, well, what you can actually do is, this is kind of neat, is from here you can say fixes number one. So it's actually going out to GitHub, and when you use the pound sign, it's looking for that issue number. And if you say fixes number one, because I have now generated this code, it's going to reference that issue in this commit. So now I've committed it, and what you'll notice is you'll go back out to GitHub and refresh, and it's not there. That's because since it's a distributed repository, you actually need to sync it back up to the upstream repository. 
And there's a handy sync button right here that you need to make sure to click after you've done commits. So you can do a bunch of commits and then um, sync at a later date. So sync does two things. It pushes up to the repository and it pulls down from the repository. So in this case, we don't have any changes that were different from what I had locally. I am only pushing changes up. So hopefully that happens pretty quickly. And then up on GitHub, what we should see is now we've updated or added these two files up here. So once these files are up, you can do things like, you know, check on the different commits. You can see all the history of those files. You can see what was included in each one of these commits. You can actually make comments on each one of the lines and say like, why did you do this? Or like, this was dumb. And then uh, write a comment on the entire conversation if you want, or on the entire commit if you wanted to. All right, so now let's say uh, I go in here and I am actually editing my module. And for whatever reason, I'm just looking at this and I'm like, oh dude, why did you put less than there? That should be greater than. And I don't have anyone code review this. I don't run any of the tests. I just change this and I'm like, gosh, I'm super smart. I'm just gonna, you know, fixing the module. So I fix the module, commit it, sync it. Everything's happy. You know, I'm a good developer. I'm using source control. Um, you know, I, I am done. But the problem is now that I've, I've checked this in, obviously the test is going to fail because, or all my tests are going to fail because I've changed this logic that is incorrect. But without any kind of auditing in place, there's no way for me to know that that happened. So what we can do is we can actually integrate with a continuous integration system. So one available continuous integration system is AppBear. Um, AppBear is, like it says, a continuous you know, delivery service for Windows. And it's used by a lot of projects. It's actually, um, I'm starting to see lots and lots of projects using this. And it's really cool because it's free for open source projects. You can pay for, um, pay for plans. Um, I think the big thing with uh, unpaid subscriptions is you get in a queue and sometimes it takes longer for your build to actually happen. So once you sign in, you can actually sign in with your GitHub credentials and it's automatically linked to your GitHub account. And you can see here I have a couple different uh, builds that I've set up. Um, but what you're going to want to click is the new project button. So the new project button, uh, since it's linked to my GitHub account, it just lists all the uh, repositories that I have. So now I have my Lorem Ipsum account and I can just click this handy dandy add button here. So now that... Uh, might be more Oh, the Nancy is a, is a .dev, oh, sorry, you can tell what it is, but it's not as excited as the name sounds like. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's a documentation, uh, it's actually, I forked a repo where it's a documentation engine for Nancy, which is a, uh, like a REST, well, it's an HTTP service that makes like uh, REST, creating REST services really, really easy. Um, but yeah, we had to do some tweaks to it, so that's why I have a fork of that. Um, all right, so now I have my build set up. So uh, what you can see here is that there's no latest build. Uh, you could, uh, it automatically tracks changes in the GitHub repo. So anytime I commit a new uh, you know, change to my repo, it will automatically start a build. But you can modify a lot of those settings here on the right-hand side. Uh, there's a bunch of settings for AppBear. Um, I'm not going to go through all these, but you know, there's certain things like you know, only building certain branches, uh, building only with certain tags, that kind of thing, um, building on a schedule. Um, you can also set things like environment, so they have different images that you can work with. You can set environment variables. Uh, you can have it run tests. You can have it run build scripts. Uh, you can have it deploy certain places, so you can automatically have it deploy to GitHub uh, releases or something like that. And then, you know, there's all kinds of other stuff. What's really important is you got to make sure you get your cool badge on your GitHub repo that says the build's passing. And then um, one recommendation that I always have with uh, App Bear is that you don't actually set all these settings in here and use this because uh, it's really hard to audit changes inside this GUI. What you want to do is actually make the changes in there, save it, and then grab the App Bear YAML file. So YAML is a yet another markup language is what it stands for. And uh, it's actually a really simple syntax and it just, the App Bear YAML file can contain all your settings that you would put in this UI. So then you can check it into your repo, and when you put it in the, the base folder of your repo, what it'll actually do is read that instead of the settings here, and then it'll uh, set up your app fair build based on that, rather than this. So if we went and actually went and built this, so what you're gonna notice is it's gonna start a build, and um, 
because I'm cheap, I don't actually have a paid subscription for this. So you're gonna notice it queues it. So that's what the status is marked here. It's queued um, and it's gonna flash this little blue thing until it starts and then eventually it will finish the build. Um, luckily, I took some screenshots of this so we don't have to wait the entire time to, uh, for this to happen, but um, I, I'll go back and show you guys as it, as it finishes sort of thing. So what you're gonna notice the first time you build a PowerShell module with AppBear without setting any settings is you're gonna get an error. So, um, oh, that was a successful build, this one. So the error here is that, um, oh man. The error here is that you need to specify a project or solution file. The directory does not contain a project or solution file. That's because AppBear is kind of set up for .NET code. It's looking for a Visual Studio solution or project in the root directory that it can build. And since we're building a, building a PowerShell module, we, we don't have that. Um, so th what we need to do is actually uh, change the way that AppBear builds. So there's a couple ways you can do that. Um, if you look in the settings, you can actually just turn off builds, and then that, you won't get that error anymore, but it won't do anything. Um, you can also just run a script, and what's nice with AppBear is you can select a PowerShell script and then um, and use whatever command lets you want to actually build your PowerShell module. In this case, you might have noticed that when I was checking, uh, you know, I was creating my module, I don't have a module manifest here. So one nice thing that we could do then is during our build, actually generate that module manifest on the fly. And since the module manifest has a version and AppBear has a version, what we can do is we can get that version dynamically and set it into our module manifest. So what I did is I actually created an AppBear YAML file. Um, I'll just take a look at that. Actually, what I'm gonna do copy that into the output directory, and then open it from there. All right, so here's a YAML file. It looks very similar to the one that I showed that was up on there. Um, it sets the version syntax, or you know, the format that you want for your version. Um, in this case, it's 1.0, and then this will increment every build. Um, then I'm using the build script keyword and specifying that it's a PowerShell script to call new module manifest. And in there, I can actually set the module version um, using the module version parameter and using an environment variable that AppBear provides. So AppBear has a bunch of different um, module or uh, environment variables that you can specify, one of them being the current build version. So it'll set those before it actually executes anything um, for your build. And then I set just a bunch of other properties for um, my module and what I can do is I can actually go and check that in. So adding my AppBear. One thing I noticed that you need to be careful of is make sure that AppBear YAML is all lowercase. For whatever reason, if it is camel case, it will not work. All right, so now, go back. Okay, so yeah, we finally got that error actually in AppBear. Um, what we'll notice here is once this syncs, it actually picked up on the fact that I committed a new change up to AppBear. So now it's actually running uh, a new build up there. So as that goes, um, what you'll see is it's gonna generate the module manifest and it's gonna succeed. And it's gonna look a lot like this. So I created a new module manifest. Um, here, I'll zoom in on that little go. Or I won't zoom in on it, will I? Okay. Um, and you can see the whole command line, which is kind of cool. So I cloned it, I checked it out, it called new mo module manifest, and then the build was a success. It didn't find any tests or anything like that, and uh, we're good to go. But remember that we have a broken project right now. We have no tests that are testing or running during the build. So this would be a great opportunity to actually uh, run some tests as part of our build to make sure that whenever a developer checks something in, it's not broken. So what we can do is update our YAML file. So let me do that. We come back over here. You can see that I have added a few more steps to our YAML file. The first step is that we need to install Pester. The uh, AppBear um, image that's running, I think is like 2012R2 without Pester installed. But what's really nice is it comes prepackaged with a bunch of other software, including Chocolatey. So since it has Chocolatey installed, we can actually just say, since Pester, it'll go up to the Chocolatey uh, package repository, uh, download Pester, install it, and it's available for us to run tests against. Um, and then the other section that I added was this uh, test script section. 
So test scripts run after the build step. So there's, uh, if you go and look at that after your documentation, there's all these different steps that the build process actually takes. And the last one that it'll take before deployment is a test, uh, test uh, I guess, test step. So in this case, we're specifying that we want to run a test script. Because by default, what it's trying to do is it's trying to find .NET assemblies that contain either NUnit or MS test. Uh, tests in them, and then it'll run those automatically. Well, in this case, we kind of have to do some special, um, special scripting to get this to work. So the first line here uh, is, actually stole this from War and Cookie Monster to do this, because it works really well. Um, and the first step here is to invoke pester. So we just call invoke pester on the current path, um, and then we want to output it as an NUnit XML file. So NUnit, like I said, is a .NET based unit testing project, but it has kind of like a standard format that lots of systems integrate with, including AppBear. So it's really nice that Pester has that because it can integrate with things like AppBear and TFS and all that kind of stuff because they know how to consume that particular format. Um, I also want to pass it through into a variable so that I can check the actual status later in this script. The next thing that I want to do is create a new web client and upload this file to AppBear. And they have an, a really nice uh, like API, like a REST API that you can deal with for doing all kinds of stuff, like setting different uh, things that appear in the build and uh, uploading tests like this. So this actually, you go to the URL, it's slash test results, slash n unit, and then you use another one of those built-in variables, uh, environment variables, for the job ID. So then app by, yep, go ahead. Sorry, a stupid question, where is this stuff running? This is running, uh, I think app bear is hosted in Azure. So all this stuff is up in... So it's in there being used? Yes, correct. It's generated by uh, temporarily to go through and process and run the execution and then purge it off as soon as the completion Okay, thanks. They list it out on the side. Okay, cool. All right, uh, yeah, so now we're gonna find this test results file, upload it up to app bear. We use the job ID to associate this file back to our job. So once it's uploaded, then it actually will parse that XML file, discover all the, you know, the tests listed in there, and then you can kind of you know, see a nice little GUI in AppBear uh, for the tests. The last line is we want to actually fail the build if the tests fail. So in this case, we're checking to see it, what the fail count is, and if it's greater than zero, we throw an exception, and that'll actually cause the AppBear build to fail, and you'll get like a red you know, build up in AppBear. So if we save this, Check this in, adding tests, commit that, sync that, and then, okay, so you can see that this, this is a previous build that I showed that doesn't do any tests, and it succeeded, so we're green right now, but like we said, um, it is a broken build. So now we added the tests to the YAML file, and it's actually going to run this build and uh, run the tests. What's gonna happen there is you're actually gonna see, um, you see something like this. Where, come on, where you get the output from Pester, and it's kind of cool because it actually formats it like exactly like you'd see in the PowerShell console, and uh, you can see all the tests failed. In this case, I must have taken the screenshot when I had three tests instead of two, but um, you can see that up in the top left where it says broken, that it's red. So you'd actually be able to look at the build, see that it's red. If you had one of those little badges out on the front of your GitHub repository, it would be red. So it's really obvious when it's broken, sort of thing. Um, so these tests are going to run, they're going to fail, and then what we can do is you can actually go out and figure out how it broke. So, you know, that's where you'd go back into source control, you could look at the commits, um, you could say, oh, this guy was fixing the module, what does that mean? It's like, oh, Adam, you're dumb. And then comment on it. And from there, what we could do is we could go and fix our build again. So I'll go back to the module, open that guy up, change it back to less than to fix the tests, and hopefully that would fixing the tests. Bam, sync. All right, so now that commits back up to master, and we go. So that's kind of how you can uh, automate things during the build. So there's lots of cool stuff that you could do here. Um, not just running tests. You could run things like Script Analyzer to have it you know, validate particular things. You could have it sign your script so that you don't have to worry about doing that locally. 
Um, anything that you can think that you'd have to do to like publish your module um, before you publish your module. So that's a great opportunity for the continuous integration system. What's also really nice is, you know, it's, it's nice for you as a single developer. Once you start working with a project with a lot of developers, that's where it really, really starts to pay off because you have merges happening. People don't always know exactly what everybody is working on. So when you merge it all together in a continuous integration system, it's super nice. The other thing you can do is set up um, different builds for different branches, um, have it run on schedules, that kind of thing. So you can do more complex things maybe once a day or something like that where you run integration tests um, and that kind of thing. All right, so now we have our module. It's fixed, it's tested, it's running. Um, I guess I could have showed what a green test looks like. Um, so if it's successful, it's just same thing. Pester output uh, looks green rather than uh, red. So. Um, but now we have this tested, uh, this tested module that we want to have people use. So what you're going to want to do is go to the PowerShell Gallery. So if you haven't been out to the PowerShell Gallery yet, it's PowerShellGallery.com. And what it is is it's based on a technology called NuGet. Um, same thing that Chocolate is based on, same thing that NuGet's based on. Um, and it's a package management system. So uh, you can upload packages, in this case modules and scripts, and then use the uh, built-in WMF5 commandlets, and I think they're WF4 now as well. Um, install, uh, install module, install script, find module, and it'll actually go out to these repositories and find the modules that are, are available. So it would be great if our module was up here and available for people to easily use when they are uh, just on the command line. So they can easily install our lorem ipsum module. So what you're going to look at is this publishing tab. So you'll notice that if you want to publish a module, the thing you want to specify is you want to use the publish module commandlet and you can specify the name of the module and then a NuGet API key. So a NuGet API key is more or less your, uh, your identifier for your account. So if, you, if I were to click on my account, you would actually see my NuGet API key, which I'm not going to do because you've got to treat it like a password. Because if anyone gets that API key, technically they could publish modules as you. So um, I'm not going to click that, but that's where you'd put that. So now let's actually go and update our AppFair YAML file to uh, do this. So I'm going to go back here on that. And go back here. You can see there's a lot more stuff going on. Uh, the first thing that I'm doing is I'm changing the clone folder. So I might just not be, uh, I but haven't used publish module all that much, so I might be doing something wrong. But I actually had to um, mess with it a little bit to get to work correctly with a path rather than a name. So if you look at what I'm actually doing with publish module down here, um, I'm just going to the path, and that's the clone folder that I'm specifying up here. So it'll automatically look in there. That's what will have my PSM1 and my PSD1. So that'll all be in there. Um, the other thing that I added, obviously, was this deploy script. So the deploy script, the first thing that it does is it installs a package provider for NuGet, which um, will also update it to the most recent version. So it's a step that's required because we are using an image that does not have that in there automatically. Um, I guess I gloss over the fact that I did change the image. So by default, the image is called Visual Studio 2015. That does not have WMF5 on it. So we don't actually have the publish module commandlet in that case. So what I can do is switch over to the app bear image called uh, in, you know, WMF5, and it has that available to us. Um, so then I'm calling publish module. I'm specifying my NuGet API key, which is this API key environment variable, and then the path to my module. So it's going to go out, it's going to discover that module manifest, it's going to look in there, upload all that metadata to the gallery, and then make it available for people to install. And what you're seeing down here is the actual uh, the de definition of this environment variable. So what you can do is you can specify an environment tag, the API key, and in this case I'm using a secure variable. So this is not my API key, this is an encrypted version of my API key. Because if you remember, when I was running my app bear key or app bear builds, you could see all the command line output. So we don't want to just dump our, our key on there for anyone to get access to. Uh, what we want to do is actually use uh, a secure variable from app bear. So the way that this works is this environment variable, when it's actually running inside app bear, is decrypted. So technically, if I were to just dump that to the command line and it printed it out, it would be an unencrypted value. But it only unencrypts it for builds that are not pull requests. So if someone forked your repo, 
changed this script to dump out your uh, API key, submitted a pull request which caused an app bear build to run, it won't actually decrypt that key. So you can't have anyone you know, maliciously trying to get your key out sort of thing. So the only time that it would run would be when you triggered a build either through a commit directly to master or pulling in that, that pull request because you validated the fact that someone didn't do something malicious with that key. So um, to create secure variables, I'll just show you how to do that real quick. Oh, our build failed. Yeah, see there, our test failed. I wonder if it fixed them. Oh yeah, fixing the test did not fix the test, so there's still something wrong there. Um, and to create an uh, encrypted variable, you can just click on your name, uh, click encrypted data, and just put whatever you want in here, click encrypt, and it'll actually give you the value and what you need to put in your app bear YAML. So that's really important. I've actually, especially for deployment purposes, there's lots of reasons that you'd want to do that. Um, for Posh tools, I actually needed to do that for the signing, the code signing cert password um, and stuff like that. So you got to be really careful because um, you can shoot yourself in the foot. I had to rekey my uh, code signing cert like four times because I kept messing this up and dumping my public key to the app fair log. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so, um, all right. So now that we have that, uh, we can actually check in our publish, which isn't going to work because our tests are broken, but that's okay. Uh, publish module. All right, so commit that. So now that's going to kick off a new build, and it's going to take that extra step of actually, um, actually publishing it. So I don't know if I actually took a screenshot of that, but that's okay because I, I don't want to wait for it to happen anyways. But um, once you actually publish something to the gallery, what you'll see is something like this. So uh, here's our lower MIPSA module that gets published. You can see you got all that metadata from my, uh, that module that I generated automatically. So uh, you know, generates the lower MIPSA text. Um, and you can see that uh, now they have functions. You can click on those, find more information about that kind of stuff. And um, it actually has the ability to you know, you can copy and paste this and run it, install it, that kind of thing. One thing you'll note about the PowerShell gallery is that this module is unlisted. So when I was making this demo, um, I came to the realization that once I published this module, I couldn't delete it. I was like, why is that case? Do you guys remember that NPM thing that happened? Or N yeah, NPM thing that happened where that guy unlisted his module from NPM? Did you hear about that? Yep. Yeah, so that's why they do this. So you can't actually delete your module. You can only unlist it so people can't find it and install it manually. So I can relist it. So now that makes it a publicly available for people to um, download again. So yeah, if you didn't hear about that NPM thing, some guy had like a 10 line uh, NPM package that like thousands of packages, uh, what's that? Seven. Seven, yeah. Seven yep, so he got like some guy, he had some naming uh, Right, you know, he had the naming rights to it pretty much, and some other company wanted naming rights. And what he he pretty much said, well, yeah, if you give me, you know, ten thousand dollars, I I will let you have the name. And they're like, no, you know, and they they took away the name from him or whatever. So he decided to unlist all his packages, which just broke the world of Linux for a while there. So um, that's what we're trying to prevent, I guess, with this. So you can't actually unlist your module once it's or uh, delete it once it's published. So. Um, yeah, so that is the module, and now it's available. You can go download it. You can go comment on my GitHub. Um, one thing I wanted to note is uh, I, I took a very um, kind of simple approach to this, and uh, there's a couple things that you might want to consider before actually doing it you know, exactly this way. Like This is a great way to kind of get up and running, um, but for one example is anytime I commit anything, it's now publishing to the gallery. So it's updating my module, and Really, it's just running automated tests. No one's really smoke testing it by hand or anything like that. Not the best idea. Uh, what you could do is create two different branches. One, a development branch where you do all your development and testing. And then once you're satisfied that something is complete, then you merge it into master. So the development branch still runs your uh, app bear tests. It just skips the publishing step. Um, and then when you pull a request into master, that's when you can decide to publish. The other thing you could do is have a manual build on app bear to actually say, I want to um, I want to publish this module now. So they'll run um, an app bear publish and, you know, complete that and publish it to the gallery. So it's a little more manual step. So you can decide when to release rather than doing it automatically. Um, yeah. So that is kind of what I wanted to cover. Um, if you guys have any questions, uh, 
I'd be happy to take them now. Otherwise, you know, feel free to get a hold of me. Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much.